this is a region about growth. This is a region that's got prospects that are really a huge potential for people and we can feed a large part of New Zealand and the world. This is the Ryan Marketing Show, and you're listening to episode 89 of 100. Today on the show, I have Wayne Walford from the Hawke's Bay Chamber of Commerce, and we're going to be talking about lots of things that affect kind of everyone in the region, because Wayne, you've got a, a role that is kind of looks over the, the whole of what's happening in Hawke's Bay. So before we get into that, first thing, thanks for having me, and um, Thank you. welcome to the show. Thank you. It's great to be here. What kind of insight do you get from being in your role about where Hawke's Bay is heading and where we are right now? Um, I suppose I get the opportunity to talk to a whole lot of businesses and understand what's going on for them uh, and try and work from the, the political component, the economic component, the, you know, what's actually happening in businesses and the environmental component, trying to get a sense of where it is, all it is. Um, at the moment, it just seems to be firing, so it's fantastic. But I think some of that is about default, is by default, rather than uh, planning. There are some great things happening on the back of cycleways, on the back of the development of, of orchards and, and horticulture. You know, millions of trees being planted that are driving this region in great ways. So I think um, the, the councils and what they're doing, the, stra- the development of, of industrial land in Hastings, uh, the plans for development here in Napier, the loosening up of, um, of land for housing, there's all sorts of things now that are driving some positive, positive reaction. That's great to hear. And I think you know, for the seven years I've been back here, I've never seen so much change in such a short space of time. So there is obviously some... Uh, strategies that are being implemented right now to mm-hmm. to bring um, you know bear the fruits for the economy in the bay. Um, where do you think we're missing opportunities in one of those areas you mentioned, whether it's the uh, economic side or the political side or the environmental side? Do you choose where you want to start with that? So I, I think we're missing some economic well economic that drives social and and um, some of that. So I think there is some great opportunity for. Uh, businesses like distribution businesses here in Hawke's Bay. The port is really a fantastic port and doing incredibly well and looking to expand with a $100 million new berth. But we shift a lot of fresh air. We need a lot of containers to send all this stuff out. We've got a lot of containers coming in with nothing in them. And that, I think, is an opportunity for us to bring things across here, bring things in here, and actually start to even the playing field. Distribution businesses are a great way of, of introducing people to and staircasing them through employment. We've already got, it's demonstrated through Big Save and through our Number One Shoe Warehouse that you can have a national distribution centre here and distribute to the rest of New Zealand or wherever and actually do it effectively and efficiently in short time frames. So it's becoming a, a great opportunity for us. And I think those are some of the things, that, along with development in horticulture, along with development in wine and tourism and all those other things. But I think that is our greatest opportunity to actually bring stuff in over the port rather than just fresh air. That makes sense because distribution, you've got two main cost inputs with people and land. So you need square meterage and you need people mm. at the lowest possible cost for the quality. Correct. And we've got both. You know, our cost per square meter is lower than Auckland, mm-hmm. lower than Wellington. Mm-hmm. Um, and we've got people here that are employed or can be employed mm-hmm. at a lower cost base because their cost of living is lower. What do you think it then takes for an organisation that currently uh, distributes out of Auckland or Wellington using their local port there to make the shift? Because in their minds, Hawke's Bay may be perceived as a tourist destination or a great place to go in summer. Mm-hmm. How do you then switch that to this is actually economic logic for where you should house the core part of your operations? Mm-hmm. 
So there's a couple of things in that. So they need to talk to their logistics companies, and logistics companies tend to work in an economies of scale type environment. So they are looking for how they can get the most movements uh, in the smallest uh, area. So Auckland works like that, works well for them, except when you've got the, the transport and some of those other issues. But we've got opportunities here. We've got people here. We've got all of those things that could make it make it even better. We just need to be telling that story. And people who live here need to be saying that we are connected, not that we're out on a limb, right? So that we actually are connected and we've got the infrastructure to connect them to the rest of New Zealand. And maybe it drives more coastal shipping, all of those things. Who knows where the future is? But I think there is a, a massive opportunity in all of that. Now, we've seen some of that already with... Dennis Paxi, his business, 3PL, head mm-hmm. third party logistics, he's yeah. already shipping for a lot of e-commerce companies, yeah. uh, the import, he does all the storage, distribution, couriering on behalf so that a digital business doesn't need to worry about the physicalities of having to do that shipping. Correct. Um, I think you're right. I think that could be more of um, how we distribute products. What about for those who are already here that are producing their you know, horticulture, their agriculture, and they're exporting out? Is this still the same opportunity? Um, look, I think there is, and science is driving a whole lot of that. You know, science around how close you can plant things together now, how you can irrigate, how you can uh, put nutrition nutrition into the plants as required, rather than dumping a whole lot of fertilizer and, and hoping that it gets to where it needs to go. Now you can they're actually managing that more closely and getting great growth and great returns. So I think science and some of those engineering robotics, all of those things are going to make a difference to and, and just help the development of some of our key uh, businesses. Which segues nicely into the environmental side of things. Yeah. Um, one of the guys we had in the show, Greg Hart from Mangarau Farms, he's very keen on not just putting fertilising everywhere, but being very smart about how he farms. Not just to do the right thing by the environment, but because there's some economic imperatives. You can get more yield mm-hmm. from your land. It mm-hmm. takes more investment up front, mm-hmm. but ultimately, if you're looking at a generational investment, it's a smart thing to do. Um, where does someone who places environment at the heart of who they are and what they do, how can they you know, latch into some of that science and R&D to, to shift what they're doing currently? So there's lots of opportunity around it. Plant and food have, have got some have great resources uh, in Havelock North, um, Hill Laboratories in Waikato. There's, there's a range of different organisations. But I think now uh, some of the suppliers and they're out there and they're actually offering this opportunity and with drones and with smart meters under the ground that can measure the, the water, the, the moisture and nutrients, all of those things, they can actually manage this more closely. So we're quite lucky at Hawks Bay because we have a lot of the, the fundamental things that you need to, to grow things. And I think mm-hmm. you know, the great things grow here is a great brand that encapsulates all that. You know, we've got sun, soil, um, and we've got a, a place that's great to live. Um, what are the, you know, on the economic side of things, what are the metrics that we judge Hawke's Bay performance by? Uh, I look at the moment, I think we're still a bit old fashioned. It's about the number of people that are employed or not employed. Um, and uh, one of the things that the media come to me with is, is their spending, is some of those things that um, people, I suppose, is a measure of confidence because if people are a bit more confident or if they've got a, a sense that things are going better for them they will invest in, in the smaller luxuries you know, hairdressers will start to do well nail bars will start to do well restaurants and cafes will do incredibly well and we've seen that already across the region that you know, businesses are just doing incredibly well so um, that drives a sort of a level of confidence but we also need to get the marketing message out there with that and actually this is a great place to be you could actually, you can do that. You can be here. You can earn maybe what, a little bit less than what you might be earning in Auckland or Wellington. But at the end of the day, with the same level of of housing and education, or maybe even better education, that you actually end up with more cash in your pocket. And an interesting life. I think one of the things that Nick Story said uh, interviewing around the Hawke's Bay Airport was now with two different carriers coming in here, just the sheer increase in passenger numbers. Mm. 
and um, anyone who gets the 715 or 815 Auckland will know that it, it's full of us doing business mm. in Auckland mm. and living in Hawke's Bay. Mm. Um, let's go back to the, the environment side of things because at the moment there's a lot of conversation around the, the water side of things mm. um, and it's not an easy topic because uh, there's been a, you know, probably two or three different streams, pardon the pun there, yeah. um, that have different emotive elements. So there's water bottling one, you know, is that fair? Uh, is it economically good for everyone or just individuals? Then there's the Rurutanifar Dam, which has some amazing potential, um, but does it economically stack up? Then there's the outbreak that happened in Havelock North with the quality of water that we um, all expected that we had for free, clean, without chlorination. And all of those issues have kind of been muddied together. Uh, I'm not going to necessarily ask you to deconstruct all of that because there's a lot in there. But from the chamber perspective, on the economic side of things, are you able to give like an opinion on each of them? So sure. economically, where does the chamber sit for water, water bottling, for the Ruotanifa Dam, and then for water as a common asset? So water bottling, uh, each one of the plants is, is different. So if you look at the one that's at Aotearoa, the next step for that water is the sea. Because the aquifer is a bucket, and it gets filled from the ranges and from the rain, and an ex any excess just goes straight out to the sea. So these people are uh, investing in this region. They've spent uh, t some between 20 and $30 million on their plant, and they will employ people, and every time they move a bottle through the port, they are paying and keeping somebody else employed, keeping the, the port assets up, all of those things that are, that are publicly um, acknowledged as ownership. So um, we, we need to be careful what we do here. We need to be, we've got other businesses in the region like, um, like fruit, for example. They use a lot of water to bring fruit to the market. They require a lot of water to enable fruit to grow. Uh, wineries, they use a lot of water to produce a bottle of wine. So uh, if, we start, uh, if we start putting a royalty on some of these things, then we've got to be fair. And where does it stop? You know? I currently live in, in Bayview and we pay water rates. We, I think we're the only region in, in Hawke's Bay that does pay water rates. But, and yeah, that's fine, I, that's what we do and, and I accept that. But um, I know that there are orchardists in Twyford that don't. They, they'll have a consent and yes, they'll pay for some of that stuff. And they're using a lot of water to keep their orchards going. So, and to keep the fruit flourishing and all of that. So if we start putting a royalty on water bottling, then we've got to do it right across the region. So sadly, there is, there's two arguments. There's an emotional argument and there's an economic argument. And I, I try to be across both of them to make sure we've got a sound conversation, but I don't see the queue of people with 40 or however many million dollars preparing to, prepared to invest in this region and employ people, I don't see that queue. If, I, if there was a queue there, then we could just we could choose who came in, but we don't have a queue. And one of the things that interests me is that the water bottling plant that isn't foreign owned doesn't seem to hit the radar at all. So not sure what's in that, but I think it's all good for uh, enabling employment and it's great to see that they want to invest here. So fantastic. Rotanifa Dam, I think we need three water storage units. Three major water storage units, Rural Tanifa, um, Nararoro, and further up towards Wairo. This region needs water. And when I see the millions of litres of water that go down the rivers when it's raining, when we have some, we have some wicked weather come through, uh, and when I see all of that water just go straight out to sea, I think there is such an opportunity lost. And it, when you look at Tukituk and Rotanifa, uh, Plan Change 6, which is about environmental, is about reducing the, the nitrates and the phosphates. Um, that, that was all done in conjunction with water storage. So uh, actually Plan Change 6 is going to come into force and is going to mean that some of the farmers that have been getting water this year won't get water 
they're, they're, they'll be restricted from their access to water because the flows have got to be greater than they currently are, and that was relying on water storage. So water storage, uh, for me, is, is, is a no-brainer. We've, I've talked to the farmers that have invested in it, and they're prepared to do that. And they've, they've had to sit down and they've had conversations with their families because the contracts are 35 years. Well, they're right of renewal for another 35 years. And if you've got the average age of a farmer being, what, 58 to 62, then they've got to have a conversation with the next generation. So where are we at? And so some of these are, are tough conversations around the dinner table, but we've got a lot of people who've committed to that. And with it available, we'll get a lot more people commit to it. So I, I just see it as, an, as a huge enabler for this region. And uh, it's a shame that it's got into the political arena and it's been held up. Infrastructure, so water as a, as a, free, um, a free entity for us to consume and to live with, um, I, I think that, you know, that, that infrastructure conversation was quite prevalent in the, in the amalgamation debate where people were saying their infrastructure is better than somebody else's infrastructure. And I don't care whose dog the blacker. But at the end of the day, we need to make sure that it's available for people and we need to be investing in those things. Um, I get challenged when people say they don't want rates to grow. Rates, you know, growth in rates actually enables development and, and we've got to be looking at the future. We've got to be looking at the next generation and the generation after that. You know, Māori have a great attitude about stewardship and you, you, you keep the thing going. You keep the whole region going for the future, for whoever is going to be here after you, long after you, rather than having a sort of self-centred approach which says, no, I don't want to spend it. I, and I get people on fixed incomes, but, you know, we've, this is a region about growth. This is a region that's got prospects that are really a huge potential for people, and we can feed a large part of New Zealand and the world. That's a great summation on the water side of things. So what I take away from that is that there are some elements of this common good where whether you believe everyone owns water or no one owns water, that it's not being priced or it's being priced sometimes to some people and not priced other times to other people. And any economist will tell you that if it's not priced in, then it won't be factored into the profitability model. Or if it's the capital as an asset, it won't be looked after in the same way because it doesn't have a financial cost. Um, something Elon Musk has been saying recently is the same applies for carbon dioxide, is that the cost of emitting the dioxide is not factored into the business equation mm -hmm. and businesses will run for the, the, the best outcome for shareholders, which is profitability. Mm -hmm. But if there's no cost to the carbon dioxide, why should they price it? Because that's not who their shareholders are. Mm -hmm. Is that mean, if that was the case with water, is there a repricing that needs to happen where some people need to pay a little bit more as a, as a residential consumer and have metered water because you get that benefit? Uh, and then others, which is, is saving a waste going out to sea, pay a different amount. I, that's a really tough decision to have because there are lots of different existing stakeholders. I think pricing water for the Rotanifer model would be, well, sorry, for, for water bottling would be a great uh, a great thing to do because then people would get a sense of, okay, so I've got an orchard and I use so many million litres and um, that will add that much cost to my operation. And then people might get a sense, well, if that adds that to the operation, then the price of those products going to market is going to be this. And then the price for you and I to buy those things will be higher. So uh, it, it would drive our, our local produce and our local wine off the, off the shelves. We wouldn't be able to buy it. We wouldn't be able to afford it because of the, the incorporated cost of water. Um, and I think that would be really sad. And so we've got to be careful and really understand what is the driver for this, for the especially the anti-water and yes I get it's emotional um, but I don't what I am struggling with is the possibility that it is xenophobic and that you know as I say there is another water bottling plant that's below the radar and it's New Zealand owned and all of those things doesn't seem to hit any any media at all so um, yeah I, I think 
it's an opportunity for employment, it's an opportunity for development, and it's an opportunity to um, to market this region. Is that then the idea with having three water storage capabilities is once you price water, the only way to dilute the cost per litre is to store more of it because then there's more available? Um, it would be because it's about supply and demand. Um, and but, but I think it just a smart use of what's coming to us naturally. You know, the rangers get a lot of rain. We get a lot of rain. It's just the whole cycling of water. Um, we get a lot of, and we need to be restoring that. I'm not sure whether uh, individual storing it is a good option. I think uh, this, the massive opportunity that Rotanifer is, um, I, I can't wait for someone to take a drone up and, and show people what this 22 hectares of dock land looks like. Uh, apparently, it's very difficult to get in because it's just absolutely not the piece of land that you'd want. So yeah, all of those, and just watching that component, the, that uh, appeal that Forest and Bird have got in with, with um, regard to Rotanifar is holding up 30 other land, dock land transfers in New Zealand. So what other things are we stopping? We've got to be really careful what we wish for in the process of, you know, actually we drive economies out. We drive people to big cities because of some of the things that we do. Um, so you just got to think about the bigger picture, and I think that's sometimes missing in people's conversations. Which is interesting because you're big on leadership, and these types of discussions and decisions require leadership. Mm -hmm. And you know, our country hasn't shied away from it in the past. We've done some really big things as a as a country. You know, whether you like the uh, anti nuclear stance or you know, housing for everyone, there's some amazing things that have been done. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I interviewed Pat Sneddon in Auckland last week about some of the things he's done uh, for Māori to get settlements underway and whether people agree or disagree with some elements of the Treaty of Waitangi. He was saying that we've made more progress than any country looking after Indigenous people mm. with two-thirds of settlements done now. Mm. Um, so let's cover a couple of areas. One is on the leadership side. Your... Uh, Background is Nati Pato descent, mm -hmm. um, so I'm, you know, I'll defer to you on um, on this area. Mana Ahariri has just um, completed a settlement in late November for nineteen and a half million dollars with the Crown. Um, economically, what does that mean for the region? And secondly, with your background, what does that mean for the people? There's many ways that you can look at this, and it'll be interesting to see how they develop and. And I, some of the, of the iwi organisations have developed uh, management groups, which is going to that, that have got specialists in there, people who can manage finances, who are good at investment, good at negotiation, and who are strategists. So those organisations will do incredibly well. And I think it's, it's a huge opportunity for uh, for business, for people, for um, yeah, for this region. I, I just think it's phenomenal. And I look at. Uh, Te Aratika, which is our new charter school out of Mangateritiri, which has been driven by uh, essentially one lady who has uh, got a civil construction business and has seen how these young men in particular um, need some support. They've been in, in, in these sort of uh, inferno situations that have been less than maybe positive and she, with some guidance and some support and good positive leadership, these kids are coming out with great attitudes and they're waiting at the gate at 6.30 in the morning for the bus to pick them up. There's none of this having to knock on the door and get them out of bed. They are waiting. They get there and they, it's just phenomenal. So I think examples like that are really great for this region. And I think uh, I've watched when I was with the Waikato Chamber of Commerce uh, Tainui and what Tainui did, and they uh, they managed to secure the funds back and created a holding group and, and with experts that drove a whole lot of uh, economic development. And now they've got a billion dollars worth of investment, and so the people will be better off. And that's a great stewardship model. It's a bit like the Hawke's Bay Foundation, which is an endowment fund where you can bequeath funds to that, and the 
interest is then given back to the community. So it actually creates an underground wealth, like a, a foundation of wealth for the region rather than a foundation of poverty. So it, I think it's really strong and, and uh, really cool. But examples like Te Aoteke, I think, are great, and we just need to be looking at how we can better utilise the resources that we've got that are there, ready to go, and, and uh, opportunities for prosperity. You've obviously got your um, eyes across a number of different issues. I can hear that through mm -hmm. you know, our chat now. For you know, your membership organisation, mm -hmm. for a company to join the Chamber of Commerce, what are some of the things that they will consider and what are the, what's the offering that Chamber of Commerce gives mm -hmm. that a business that doesn't have a membership is missing out mm -hmm. on? So it depends where they are. It depends what they're looking to do. And I get that it's what's in it for me, right? So if I'm paying out $200, I want to know what I'm getting in return. Well, actually, the return comes from your participation, from your being part of the process. Now, we have a speed networking event, which has 20 people in the room, and it's a really high-power event, and people queue to get in there. Queue to be part of the process. Uh, it's actually hard work. You're, give, you're talking your elevator pitch, uh, elevator pitch, and uh, about your business for two minutes solid. Then you listen to the other person, uh, and to do that twenty times in one night is pretty intense. So, and one of the things I say to people is actually it's not so much about getting your message across; it's about knowing what else is around the market, so that you can refer. Because a bit like pay it forward. The referral comes back to you and you and you become a really good corporate citizen and, and people recognize you as a valid business and all of a sudden you've got a, a profile that comes out of nowhere and you go, how did that happen? So events like that. So some of our, our networking events, we did, did one recently in Hastings that uh, when we surveyed the people, it seemed to be fantastic. They were just blown away by the opportunity to go in and understand what this business did. Uh, to have a look through the, the plant and just to meet some of the people as well as have some beautiful food and some nice refreshments and talk to the people, network around the people. So I'm always watching to see that people aren't on their own so that we can often hawk space said to be clicky or hard to get into groups. Well, I'm pretty good at getting people into introducing people and, and helping them find a way into those groups. So that's a, one of the things we do. Business awards is, is massive uh, and it takes some uh, management. So that is about um, identifying our leaders, our, our, our positive businesses, and actually putting them up on the podium. And we're not good at that. This region's not good at um, celebrating success, about looking at people and going, how you know, how can I get there? What are the steps they've gone through? How can I get there? Because it's just a process. And if you follow the same sort of steps or the same sort of attitude, you'll get there. It's guaranteed. So um, I, so trying to drive aspiration, trying to drive a desire to be uh, a better business, whether it's about uh, your health and safety, your employment, your financial structure, or whatever it is, just making sure that businesses are more sustainable uh, and we create prosperity across the region. So those sorts of things, uh, events, we've got a, a great uh, a guy coming today uh, that from, with regard to digital loyalty. So that's been a really popular, popular event. We're looking to drive some conversation around employment over 50. So what, you, what are the options? What are you looking for? Uh, there are some challenges around education. There's some challenges around uh, understanding what the jobs are going to be. Because so many of them, we don't know what they're going to be. So preparing for that is interesting. And I look at uh, some of the models around the world, like the Harvard MBA model is case study driven. So you get a case study and you, as a group, you talk about the situation, you you learn wisdom about that process, how to process these certain situations. So it's about, you might be applying maths, you might be applying science, you might be applying um, some cultural beliefs, you might be applying whatever it is, but you learn how to put that all together to come out with a, a positive result. 
So some of that and just yeah, where where education's going and um, I get a bit excited about it. It's uh, it's really positive and so we're we're trying to do all those sorts of things and so for a small team of four we also do certificates of origin. So every box, every container that goes out of here has a certificate of origin with it. Um, so you can imagine we're coming into a busy period over March, April, May. Uh, it's massive, massive for this region. So we provide that service. Um, so the common thread through there is collaboration. And when a market's moving quickly, particularly with technology and how we communicate, certainly groups like the Chamber or case study driven groups, that's going to help because you are going to keep up even if your business isn't changing, you're going to keep up with where things are moving to. As long as people do, you're right. Uh, one of the first things that people forget to do when they're busy is communicate, is keep the communication going, right? Is keep actually sending stuff, talking to people and finding out what's going on. So that's the working on the business as well as working in the business. And, you know, with 11,000 of our 18,000 uh, businesses employing uh, no people, right? So of the, of the 18,000 businesses in the region, 11,000 are sole proprietors and don't employ anybody. So there's a lot of people that are on the wheel, that are on the mouse wheel and going flat out. So that ability to get up and have a look around and hopefully we can be that catalyst for that to have them come up and go, okay, so this, and talk to people and just get a sense of what it is. We need to be looking for more information. We need to be garnering um, wisdom and and resources to help us grow. And when we're busy, we hunker down and go down and get right into the business and work, work, work. Um, so it, it's, it is great to see the economy, but we've just also got to remember to communicate and to get up, have a breath. Uh, as I said to somebody the other day who's a cricket fan, I said, spend some more time in the nets. Just take some time, get a sense of who you are, where you are, and enable your business to grow from that. Great advice, Wayne. Uh, we have tackled some meaty topics today, uh, head on, and I think that's part of the collaboration, is having these discussions. Mm. And I know you'll get feedback from this, I'll also get feedback from it, and I think that's what moves the conversation forward and ultimately helps move Hawke's Bay forward. So. Um, whether it's having those conversations at the chamber or on interviews like this, I think uh, what you're doing today in, in general is, is great um, for the region and you know for any of those 11,000, I didn't realise it was that many yeah. uh, single proprietors in Hawke's Bay to get along to an event. Sounds like that speed networking one's the, the one to start at. Mm -hmm. It's a great opportunity. Well, actually, one last question. The how, And this is more for um, you know, the, the students who listen to this from EIT and uh, uh, maybe not understanding what does a chief executive officer do and what does it do versus what a board does and the president. They all sound very cool roles, mm. but what's the difference? How does a decision get made with all those different people in a room? Yeah. So can I just, I just want to finish, sorry, I just thought of when you mentioned the students, we also run Young Enterprise across the region. So that's a fantastic, a fantastic um, opportunity for uh, financial and commercial acumen for young people. So uh, what does a CEO do? Well, look, um, let's start with the board. The board create um, a strategy. They, they agree on a strategy and they are the, sort of the governance, the, the accountability for the organisation. And the CEO is then responsible for making it, taking that strategy and actually making it happen. So the CEO is the, is I suppose the driver of, of the ship or whatever it is, but it's making sure, so you've got to make sure that your team is in the right space. You've got the right level of skills. You're across a whole range of different things that you need to be dealing with. Um, and yeah, so it's a bit like the ringmaster in the circus, but, but there's another layer above you where you, that, that actually, they drive that governance, they are over those things and they are, the accountability I probably is the, is the best option, best word. And then, yeah, the, the CEO actually makes sure that that actually happens and has to report to that. So, so the it, CEO, even the CEO even has a boss and that's a, the board. Absolutely. And you've got to implement what your, the strategy. Yes. And then report back on how 
for it, you've, how successful you've been at that strategy, right. and then do they then provide more guidance of what you should be doing next? Well, look, they're just over they're making sure that they are connected, they're from a range of different industries, so the input is great, and uh, we use, I'll use them for a range of different things, you know, where they might come in and host an event rather than me hosting an event, or uh, just so that we get some connection and we get them involved in the process. So, the, yeah, they are the, the, I suppose, they are the drivers. I'm the, um, well, they are, uh, they're setting the map, right? They're setting the, the plan for where we're going to go, and I drive the vehicle, which includes the team, um, to that place and achieve those goals, or wherever we decide to go in the meantime. So, um, yeah, the roles do sound great. Uh, but yeah, the, it takes a bit of work and you've just got to be on your game. So getting plenty of sleep, keeping a you know, reasonable amount of exercise and that's where this region works. Great advice. Uh, thank you very much for your time today, Wayne. Uh, you've been very generous. And um, for everyone listening, I think there is something in there to learn and the takeaway has got to be start the conversations with the people around you. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, if everyone's having smart conversations, then that's going to create discussions that are meaningful that yep. moves all of us forward so Absolutely. I really appreciate your time today and thanks my for pleasure me. thanks Ryan thanks Wayne if you like this episode remember to subscribe for free on iTunes simply search for the Ryan Marketing Show in the iTunes store